Welcome back guys. So let's jump right into this video. In late antique, late Roman, um, however you want to conceive of that, and early medieval studies, there's, in terms of scholarship, uh, something of a reformation and a counter-reformation, to borrow James O'Donnell's phrase, uh, who's a PhD who works on this period, going on, which will get its own video. Um, but briefly, what is this? Well, for about 200 years, uh, since Edward Gibbon published the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in the late 1700s, the way historians and archaeologists and classicists usually thought about that period was the Roman Empire collapses in fire, death, brimstone, chaos, right? Barbarians come in, they set the empire on fire, they burn the cities, and it goes away. It was a chaotic period. Well, in 1971, Peter Brown publishes The World of Late Antiquity, and he basically creates late antiquity as its own field. As a field, as its own uh, area of research, late antiquity tends to focus on the Eastern Empire, what we know as the Byzantine Empire. It focuses on continuity. It focuses on Christianity, etc. So that's the Reformation in this whole uh, scholarly area. The Counter-Reformation, though, is, well, late antiquity is not wrong. But there has been pushback against the idea. And one of the key books in that Counter-Reformation is this. Peter Heather's The Fall of the Roman Empire, A New History of Rome and the Barbarians. It was published in 2005 by Oxford. It runs about 459-ish pages. Um, and this is what we're going to be talking about in this video. So what's the central argument of this book? Well, what Peter Heather is basically arguing, okay, is that the death of the Roman Empire, you can't look at it and just argue one specific thing. It was taxes, it was plague, it was, you know, insert thing here. It's a multifaceted event. As far as the barbarians are concerned, though, they don't outright murder the empire. What they do is commit manslaughter, and then they're left with the pieces. So, in arguing that, Heather is doing two things. One is he's kind of going back to the more uh, conservative way of viewing things, that to some degree it was the fault of these people we call the barbarians. But he adds a little nuance to it. In arguing that they don't outright murder the empire, they accidentally commit manslaughter, he is tweaking the argument. So we have to ask the question then, well, why are these people there in the first place? The answer that Heather gives, and this again goes back to the more conservative way of viewing this, um, is that the barbarians are in the Roman Empire due to the fault of the Huns. The Huns show up, and at first they push a whole bunch of Goths across the Danube, and then eventually they push others. Franks, Alemanni, Suaves, the list kind of goes on here. And once these guys cross into the Empire, most of these groups don't form and this isn't necessarily Heather's argument, he's building on others, and this is basically correct here. They don't form uh, dominant tribes in the way that we typically think about this stuff in the popular imagination. Just because Goths and Franks and whoever else move into the Empire didn't mean that all of those people who constitute that ethnic group or that tribe picked up stakes and moved. There's a chunk of Goths in the Empire, there's a chunk of Franks, etc. And what these units do is form mobile armies. There are still Goths and Franks living on the other side of the frontier. Um, but these are, within the Roman Empire, military forces which are mobile, which happen to have their families and belongings follow them, and which happen to be composed, okay, of largely non-Roman forces. Some estimates put this at about 30%, 25, 30, 35% by the 400s. And it's not that these armies wanted to destroy the empire. It's that they wanted to work with the empire. And the Roman inability to competently manage these groups leads to issues. In the 4th century, and Heather argues this you know, convincingly, and he's drawing on other scholarship which has uh, definitively demonstrated the same thing. In the 4th century, the Roman Empire was essentially healthy there's not necessarily any indication that the empire is going to collapse in the 300s. There are problems, yeah, um, but, you know, they're not anything that's necessarily going to destabilize the empire. It's not necessarily anything that 
the Empire hasn't faced before, like a couple civil wars. The Empire had gone into civil war before, and it came out fine. So something like that, you know, it's not a bug, it's a feature. So, in the 4th century, the Roman Empire wins more battles than it loses, and we know from archaeology and texts, like surviving tax documents, etc., that in the 4th century, the economy across the entire empire was booming. There's a healthy rate of migration, some estimates put this at like 35-40% of merchants and others moving around Roman roads and sea lanes in the 300s per year. Uh, there's healthy trade, there's strong tax collection, yeah, there's some inflation, there's some currency problems, which stem from the crisis of the 3rd century, but they're being worked on, they're being solved. So, there's some issues, nothing too problematic, well then what happens? Heather argues, um, and I agree with him here, and Chris Wickham also picked up this line of argument, as do a couple others. When the Vandals move into Africa, what it does is it cuts off the tax spine of the Western Empire, and once that happens, the state can't adequately deal with actual issues, military or otherwise. There doesn't appear to have been, um, in the late 3rd century into... There doesn't appear to have been, in the late 4th century, into the 5th century, any kind of issues in the military uh, with pay, training, recruitment, so much as the state can't collect taxes anymore to really deal with the problems they need that military to deal with because they don't have North Africa. The loss of Africa means they have to tax poorer areas, which leads to issues, which we'll talk about in another video. As a modern day analogy, um, if anyone's not American, in my country we have this chunk in the Midwest uh, that we know as the Rust Belt. This is an area centered around like Detroit, Chicago, like that area. It's a place where America used to manufacture a lot of its vehicles, cars, etc. Uh, and once that area shut down, the Midwest became fairly impoverished. Well, the West Coast, California, Oregon, that region, makes up a significant chunk of America's taxes. If that area were to be lost, and America then loses that revenue if they have to increase taxes in the Rust Belt, a place that can't necessarily afford it, you know, literally and figuratively, eventually the state's going to run into problems. Same idea. The Empire loses Africa, they can't get as much money as they need. Now they start having problems. By 476, the Western Empire goes away, right? This is when it, quote-unquote, falls. Well, it doesn't fall in the sense that... You know, it's a video game, the armies are defeated, the cities are captured, and poof, it's gone. It's just not worth holding together anymore. Locals and barbarians create uh, what we know as local rooms. That's not something that necessarily comes from Peter Heather. It comes from, um, to my understanding, from Peter Brown. But it's what happens. People make Rome in microcosms across the empire. So, with that being said, you know, that's his argument. Let's talk about what Heather does really well in this book, and what he does not so well. One of the key strengths for this book, okay, is that it is very strong in terms of uh, a political and military narrative, something that is sorely needed after about, I don't know, two, three, four decades of postmodernist monographs. We'll talk about what that means in another video, um, but the short answer for this video is that there was more of an emphasis for a couple decades on really, really um, small, concise studies of different topics in history, not any kind of broad narrative. So after a while, you have a ton of pieces, well, you have to unify it somehow. Heather does that very well. He uses not only textual sources, he uses advances in archaeology, uh, dendrochronology, he uses pollen data, etc. to build a fairly convincing narrative. It also brings up the decline and the notion that there really was a collapse. It brings it back into focus. As far as the negatives of this book, uh, well, there's very little influence in this book on the scholarship, uh, which deals with ethnogenesis and the nation building of barbarian tribes and barbarian kingdoms, like work by, you know, uh, Richard Venkis and Patrick Geary. But I would add here that he does address those things in another book, his 2009 Empires and Barbarians, so what you want to do, ideally, is read that alongside this one. It's also not entirely objective, as it does have a very strong uh, Roman bias, but 
But then again, that's not entirely surprising considering the title of this book, right, The Fall of the Roman Empire, and some of the sources we actually have for the event in question. He also tends to breeze through some topics, assuming prior knowledge on the part of the reader, and at this point, it was published in 2005, it's now 2021 when I'm doing this video, at this point, um, it's severely outdated on uh, Hunnic studies. There's been a lot of advantage, particularly by a scholar by the name of Kim, so it needs a lot of updating in that regard. And, you know, to a degree, despite their shortcomings, I do find his argument, to a degree, persuasive, although I personally think that there's maybe too much emphasis on the barbarians. The collapse of the Roman Empire is more complex than just a whodunit. But it is a needed correction, considering where the literature stood when this book was written and published. Nevertheless, you know, despite those drawbacks, it does remain an important cornerstone of the pushback against Peter Brown and the late antique uh, continuity method of thinking about these events. So it is required reading. So with that, guys, I'm going to end the video. If you're interested in the period, you need to at some point pick this up. Hopefully this was useful for you, and I'll see you all next time.